Very good. Well, I'm thankful that each one of you have come tonight. We're going to be taking a look tonight at John chapter number 11. So if you're turning your Bibles to John chapter number 11 tonight, uh, the title of the message is, Will You Do Your Part? You know, we consider um, serving God as a, as a Christian, as a believer in His Son, Jesus Christ. And you know, if if all we had to do was believe in Him at that moment of salvation and there was nothing else for us to do, He would have taken us home, wouldn't He? Um, but He's left us here because we have some work to do. And we even consider, um, as we watch Him work in our lives, um, we need to remember that God always does His part. And His part has nothing to do with us. His part is the part that only He can do. But He always has something for us to do in the midst of that. And so as we consider um, the Scripture tonight as we read in, in John chapter number 11, you know, we, we look at the photo here on the cover page of uh, the Capitol building and, and the flag in the background and somebody holding the sign that says, Do your job. And now, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure that comes um, from what we do in a secular world. You have a job out in the secular world, you're, you're pressured to accomplish certain things and certain timing, and, and if it was easy, boy, they'd, they'd be paying you a lot less for what you're getting paid, right? And uh, it's always easy for us to point the finger at other people and say, man, that guy's not doing his job, or that woman, they're not holding their weight, they're not doing their job, but you know what? We ought to be looking at ourselves, and we ought to be doing the very best for ourselves and pay a little less attention to whether anybody else is doing their job or not. Um, focus on our job description. Amen. And we're going to see a little bit about that uh, tonight. So let's take a look here at John chapter number 11 tonight. Familiar passage of scripture. Um, very familiar for each one of us. Um, John chapter number 11. Uh, we're going to be looking here at the resurrection of Lazarus. And John chapter uh, number 11 and verse number 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. We consider the close circle of uh, people that are involved here. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, of course, but uh, He was God in the flesh manifested unto us. And you know what? Just like He builds relationships with us today, He built relationships with people while He walked upon the face of the earth as well. And here when we look at Mary and Martha and Lazarus, He had very good relationship with each one of them. He loved them. And you know, we can say and we can know by the Word of God today that Jesus loves each one of us. He loves us beyond what we can comprehend. But as we look at this particular event that's recorded in Scripture here, we can see Jesus Christ further demonstrating His love toward mankind as He interacts with Mary and Martha and Lazarus here. Verse number 3, Therefore His sister sent unto Him, saying, Lord, behold, He whom Thou lovest is sick. And so Mary and Martha are here. Their brother Lazarus gets sick. And right away what they do is they uh, send out uh, a request for Jesus Christ to come show up on the scene. They need Him, don't they? The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 6 to be careful for nothing, but in everything with, or by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. God wants to hear from us. That's part of what you and I need to do in our relationship with the King of Kings. We've got to talk to Him. We've got to let our requests be made known unto Him. We need to let Him know how we feel about uh, the circumstances and the things that we feel may be bearing down on us in our life. Now, we need to pray for our government, right? We need to pray for people in offices. We need to pray for people in leadership around here. But we need to pray for ourselves that we would follow the ways of God ourselves. And we need to ask God to be showing us those things. Uh, Psalm 139, verse number 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Now, that's our part as well. We need to uh, let our requests be made known unto God. Amen. And uh, we need to consider as God searches us um, what we ought to do next in the equation that we're involved with. 
And so we see here, uh, Mary and Martha, they send word and they make a request that they'd like for Jesus to come here. Send Him. Send for Him. Tell Him uh, we need Him here. Verse number 4, When Jesus heard that, He said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. We consider this very statement right here as they come to Jesus with a very, very urgent matter. Lazarus is dying. He's sick unto death. The people know that. And they send message to Jesus to come. And Jesus' response straightway, right away, the first thing He says is, this sickness is not unto death. This man's not going to remain in the grave. Now, they don't understand this. Um, You and I, at times, as we get involved with the Lord and we try and figure out what He's going to do and what His timing is going to be, now, we sometimes don't understand it. We don't get it. We can't get our head around it because we're not God. Um, His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Um, He has a bigger picture involved that He gets to look at than our limited view that we get to look at. Verse number 5, Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. He demonstrates and the Word of God verbalizes the love that He has for them. And it's amazing to see that God, even um, as it's shown here early on in this event, that Jesus loves these human beings very much. He loves them. And they've called for Him. And they need His help. And He's going to fix what they have going on. But I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of take them for a little bit of a loop as far as what He chooses to do in and through this moment um, that we're about to see here. Verse number 6, When He had heard, therefore, that He was sick, He abode two days still in the same place where He was. We consider this right here. We, we see God do something like that and we go, what? Like, I... I I thought, he, I thought he was going to come right away like I called for him. You think about this specific event. Lazarus is dying and they call for him and the messengers come. And typically when someone has an urgent message, man, you're, you're dropping everything you're doing and you're getting out of there. Uh, think about it. Someone has an emergency, a car accident, or they're rushed to the hospital or something. Uh, most of all of us, we, we drop everything right that moment and we go tend to that manner. But that's how we view things in our circumstances. And once again, we don't, we don't view things like God views things. And the Bible says here that Jesus hears that He's sick and they're calling for Him urgently. And we know God knows the hearts and the thoughts of mankind. He knows the, the uh, grief that they're going through watching their brother um, taking his last breaths, if you will, very sick. And Jesus stays in that same place for two more days. Imagine Mary and Martha and maybe some of the other family and friends that are there. What, like, did you call for him? The messengers have probably already close to made it back. Maybe they have made it back. I'm not sure. But I could see Mary and Martha and others like almost tapping their foot like, where's the Lord at? Like, we called for him. Why has he not come here? And someone says, oh, I, I, I saw him back there still. He said he'll be here as soon as he can. Well, what do you mean he's back there still? You know, we get a little bit wound up over that. But God has things under control, doesn't He? Verse number 7, Then after that saith He to His disciples, Let us go into Judea again. And so Jesus' timing here, now He says, okay, um, He's waited two days, and He says, okay, perfect timing, uh, let's go. We're going to go back into Judea. Now consider this here, what His disciples say in verse number 8. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? The disciples are recognizing the danger and the turmoil that's there, and say, what are you kidding around? You're going to go back there like they're all after us. We just got out of there not too long ago. We barely escaped with our lives, and now you're wanting to return there. Once again, more people in this equation that do not understand God's ways and what God is currently working on. But I would challenge us, as we make that request of God, that we really need to listen to what God's going to say instead of saying, well, this is how we're going to get it done. All right, Lord, I'm glad I got your ear. Now let me tell you how it's going to play out. Uh, by next Tuesday, I need you to, to answer this here. And, and you know, we, we try and do that. 
And here, Jesus telling His disciples, you know what, we're going back, and they're like, man, I think you're half crazy, Lord, because it's very dangerous in that way. And you know what, sometimes when we get involved with circumstances, and we cry out to God, and we ask Him to, to make Himself known to us, and to, to come and, and help us solve something, um, a lot of times um, there may be painful circumstances involved. There may be a little bit of turmoil happening around us. We may, um, as we get further down the road in that, man, we want more immediate rescue. This is painful. This is, this is causing me turmoil within my heart and mind. I'm, I'm becoming anxious over this. I'm, uh, I'm thinking that, God, you ought to be doing something. You said you love me. Like, where are you? Come on, I, uh, I'm waiting to hear something from you. But once again, God's timing is perfect. And we need to understand that as we seek out God's help in our lives for things, we're on His timetable. We're in our best interest to follow His plan on the way He lays it out for us. Amen? And as we consider making our requests known unto Him in the midst of our circumstances, and at times the, the matters are very, very urgent in our own hearts and minds, and sometimes things can be downright uh, tumultuous with relationships and just different things that are happening around us. And man, we need to an answer and we need it now. And if we're not careful, we can be a little impatient. And we can be a little pressing to the Lord. And you know, at the end of the day, we've got to agree with what God says. We can't press forward and just say, well, I'm, I'm going to do it in my, in my timing and my way uh, anyway. But you know what? We need to recognize that we're going to do it in God's way. Amen? Down to verse number 11 of John chapter 11. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Jesus knows that he's died. He knows he's not any longer. But he's not going to stay dead. And Jesus knows that. And, and who wakes up from the dead? <laughs> Amen? And nobody wakes up from the dead. Only our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as He uh, allowed these great miracles to be performed here and by some of His disciples, um, we'll learn here that in verse 24, Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Amen? And here He sees uh, Lazarus. He knows he's dead. And He says, man, he's, he's just asleep and I'm going to go wake him up. Now remember what Jesus said um, back in verse number 4. He says, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. And you think about the turmoil that's been allowed to play out in Mary's life and Martha's life and others that are around there and the great pain that they're having to experience as now they have a brother, a close person, a loved one perish and they've buried him in the grave. We know that that is an emotional roller coaster that is very difficult uh, to, to go through in life. And yet Jesus knows that it's necessary for them to go through this so that He might be glorified as the Son of God. Verse number 12, Then said His disciples, Lord, if He sleep, He shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. The disciples didn't know the details. God knows the details. Amen. And they're soon going to get word that, that he is actually dead from some other people. But the Lord already knows that he's dead. And he's told the disciples that he is going to wake him up. That he's just asleep and he's going to wake him back up. And it's went... It's went right over their head, hasn't it? And so often when we cry out to God and we ask Him to rescue us and we ask Him to help us and, and we pray that He'll do some things on our behalf and the, the timing doesn't seem to be working out the way we thought it was going to work out and we start getting a little perplexed about things and a little anxious about things and sometimes as we read the Word of God, as we pray, and God's given us an answer straight right in our face with His Word, it just goes, it goes right over our head. Because we're so caught up in the circumstance that we're in with the pressure and man, we got to get this done and all these things and we miss the things that God says to us. 
And so verse 14, I'm so glad that Jesus gave it to him Barney style right here. This is what it says in verse 14. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He just has to tell them because they're not getting it and they're not understanding it. And as, as you know, his followers, um, we're human beings. We're bound in this body, these flesh and bones that we're in. And you know what? Um, our heart is deceitful. And we get pulled this way and that way and our emotions play a part in this. And <clears throat> just like pain is an emotion and just like fear is an emotion, these are just things that we get to experience in our life that are kind of key indicators for where we are in life. Um, but they're just an emotion. We need to control them. Amen. We need to bring in to captivity every thought that exalteth itself against God. We need to take, take control of the battlefield right here, our mind. And so when our flesh is pulling us away, when the enemy is pulling us away and saying, man, this has got to happen now. And God don't love you that much because he ain't answered it. And, and all these things, you know what? God's still speaking to us. God is still on the throne, isn't he? His timing's just not our timing. And his ways are not our ways. And here in the midst of this big uh, circumstance that's happening here, Lazarus is now dead. And listen what Jesus says right here. And I, I think they're going to miss it. Okay? Verse number 15. He's telling them, my timing is perfect. And here we go. This is all playing out exactly how I wanted to play out. Listen, verse 15, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. He tells him again, now This is good that I'm not there on the spot. Because it would have not proved the intent that I had it. I'm here to do these things for your benefit. So that you might believe. So that your faith may be increased in a way that would not be possible had you not traveled through these specific circumstances. Unless you had not had these emotional strings pulled in your life and exercised by them where you can learn to uh, uh, gravitate towards uh, the Word of God and Him and stand on the rock and not be uh, swayed by how these fleshly bodies will make us feel at times. And the emotions that pass through and the, the thoughts that come through. You know what? We need to rule this battlefield in here. And we need to remember, you know what? I'm going to make my request known unto Him. And I'm going to follow His way. And I'm not going to get all anxious about the timing. I'm not going to worry about how long or this or that or the other. I'm going to follow what God wants me to do and I'm going to do my part. Verse 16, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now that may seem kind of out of the, the context of what's going on here, but it's not. The danger was very, very high for the disciples and for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, um, knowing that He's God and He's doing His will here, okay? But the circumstances in life are dangerous. And, and Thomas says here, well, let's go. Like, they're going to kill Him. Let's just go and let's all be killed as a result. That's how dangerous it is for them to go back to Judea. But Jesus says, come on, let's go. This is working out perfectly for me. You think about it. Mary and Martha are falling to pieces right now. Their brother's dead. They called for the Lord. They don't feel that the Lord showed up when He needed to to remedy these circumstances. And they're, they're anxious and I believe they're beside themselves over this. Verse 17, Then when Jesus came, He found that He had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh into Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met Him. And so we see here Martha, as she hears that Jesus is finally on, her, on His way, man, she goes out to meet Him. What do you think's on her mind? Her brother Lazarus. And Lord, you didn't you didn't come here when you were supposed to. And what, what, what are you doing? Like it's 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 already happened. The Bible tells us he's been in the grave for four days already. She goes out to meet him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. 
She goes out to meet him, but she goes out there and she's kind of letting him have it a little bit. She's like, oh, you know, I, I, I called for you, Lord. I, you, you love me, right? You love my sister. You love my brother. And I, I called and I asked you to come. And now he's been in the grave for four days already. And, and now you show up on the scene. We get like that sometimes. Now, we may not go into the throne room of grace and have the boldness to pray and utter those things to God, but he knows what's in our heart. He knows what our thoughts are. And he knows how we feel. So you might as well be open and honest with him as you go and just say, Lord, help me to not feel like this because I feel like this and I know I shouldn't based on your word. But a lot of times we won't. We'll we'll stay there and we'll begin to pine away and, and we'll be a little bit like Martha here and be like, man, I can't believe God didn't come through like I thought he should come through. He should have been here last week or last month or whenever to handle this. And she's... She's getting on him in verse 21. Listen to what she says in verse 22. She says, But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. She knows who Jesus is. She knows that He's God in the flesh. And I think she almost caught herself a little bit of, as I consider these words. You ever been there where you say some stuff and all of a sudden you go, hmm... Yeah, that wasn't a good idea. And you kind of try and come back from that and back up a little bit. And now she's talking to God. That's a completely different story than the interactions that you and I have with people. And I believe that she came and she recognized this to him. You know what? I, I know that you are God and you could do anything that you choose to do. And I almost feel like as Martha came, I can hear her taking a deep breath and exhaling and going, why am I so wound up over this? And her brother's in the grave. But yet she recognizes that anything that Jesus chooses to do will happen. What a comforting thought. What a comforting thought to think as we go to Him and we ask Him to to help us and, and to provide for us and to guide and direct us. That He has this. He's got it under control. He's God. Verse number 23, Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Now he means when he shows up. That's what he's talking about. But once again, look at the mind frame of Martha here. Verse 24, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She knows what the resurrection is. She understands that. But she's not thinking in terms of today. She's not thinking that. She's allowing these events in life as she looks through it through her finite brain of being a human being. She really doesn't understand what God's going to do here. Remember Jesus said way back in verse number 4 that His sickness is not unto death, but that God may be glorified. Amen? That's the purpose of this. And here she acknowledges the resurrection, but same thing, um, she misses it. He tells her your brother is going to rise again. And she's thinking of the resurrection to come at the second coming. She's like, "Mm, yeah, I understand that. I believe that, Lord, but he's in the grave right now. As we think on our circumstances and our events that are going on in our life, if we're not focused on God and making him first place and really giving him that first place position and saying, like Martha said in verse uh, 22 here, I know that thou art God and whatsoever thou sayest will, will happen. Unless we take that position, boy, we're going to miss some stuff. We're going to miss some stuff that's put right in front of us. Listen to what Jesus says in verse number 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. She clearly, she wasn't thinking in these terms, was she? Verse 26, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You know, as we consider and we make these requests known unto God, as we try and listen to hear what God has to say to us, it's also our part to believe God for what He has said and trust Him 
We make our requests known to Him. We, we listen for Him. And then when He gives us some direction, um, if we're not careful, um, His words start going right over our head. And we want to, in our timing, we want to, in our way, we want to do it uh, in the way that my mind has already played this out. And once again, nobody would have expected that Jesus Christ was going to show up and raise Lazarus from the dead out of a grave. And Jesus, as He challenges her with the thought of the resurrection... He says, believest thou this? Believing and trusting is, is really paramount to our lives as believers. I mean, if we recognize God and who He is and we know that He can do anything that He wants to do and He can solve any of our circumstances at any moment if He chose to and He has our best interests in mind, do we live like we believe it? Or are we up in the middle of the night worried about it because we're trying to control it and it doesn't seem to be playing out the way we thought it would play out verse number 27 she saith unto him yea lord i believe that thou art the christ the son of god which should come into the world and when she had said so she went her way and she called mary her sister secretly saying the master is come and he calleth for thee I don't know that I missed it here in Scripture. Did, did Jesus say, go get Mary somewhere? And I'm not sure what's going on here exactly. I think Martha needs some backup maybe. She's, she's got to get her sister involved. You know, uh, I'm not really sure. But she goes and gets her sister and says, Mary, you've got to come. Um, the Lord is coming. He's here. Verse 29, as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto Him. Once again, you wonder the motivation of Mary now as she comes. Mary actually stayed back. She was weeping there in the graveyard and, and weeping amongst all the people. And people were coming and sharing their condolences with her. And she was just there weeping. And as soon as she hears the Lord is on His way, boy, she snaps up. The Bible says she, she arose quickly and she went to go meet Him. Do you think she was going to praise Him? Thank God your timing's perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming now. Verse number 30, Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place wherein Martha met Him. He hadn't made it there yet. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, uh, that she rose up hastily and went out, they followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. And so all the people that were comforting her, Mary was, was beside herself. And man, they, they were trying to encourage her. And man, there she goes again. She's out of here. She must be going back to the grave to cry some more. And they follow after her. And I believe they're surprised. Verse 32, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was, and saw Him, and fell down at His feet, saying unto Him, Lord, if Thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. You'd think as she fell down on her feet, she would be there praising Him and bringing honor and glory to Him and saying, thank you, your, your timing, even though I don't understand it, is perfect, but we know that's not how it goes for human beings. It doesn't go that way for you and I, man. She's, she's wound up in her circumstance, and she says the very same thing her sister did. Man, if you'd have just been here earlier. It's too late. Is God ever late? God is never late. His timing is perfect. He's God. He, he knows everything. He knows what He's doing. And this is amazing here as Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, is watching these things going on. You think about the condition of Mary and of Martha and all these others that loved Lazarus as they followed her out and they're now there where Jesus is, just outside the town. And Jesus is watching these people being tore up with sorrow and grief because of the death of a loved one. Listen to what Jesus says here, verse number 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. When we talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ being exposed to all 
human infirmities and temptations and all these things and that He can truly understand where we are because He's lived in a fleshly body. He climbed into one of these houses, remember? And He knows what it's like. And He understands the grief that these people are going for or going through. And the Bible says He groaned in His spirit as He saw these people grieving and in pain. But do you remember... He's accomplishing His purpose here, isn't He? And there's pain and sorrow involved for the people that He loves, even to the place where He sees them going through this. He groans in His very own spirit being God in the flesh because He he sees them going through. Because He understands it. And He knows the grief that they are suffering from and the loss of Lazarus. I find it interesting that Jesus groaned in the spirit jesus already knows that he's going to raise lazarus from the dead and he's going to be there but jesus is really demonstrating his great love toward humanity here as he just watches and he has compassion and feeling about what we're going through or think that at times he doesn't understand us or maybe he doesn't he doesn't really relate to me you don't know how sad I am or, or why I'm feeling anxious or why I'm fearing fearful. He don't get it. He does get it. And He's God in the flesh. And he's, he's, he's trying to get us to see that He has things under control. He's going to do the heavy lifting. We just got to do the little part that He's going to reserve for us. And God always has a part for mankind to do. We just got to be willing to do it and not get all caught up in the events of life to the place where we fail to serve Him and take those steps that He called us to take. Verse number 34, and He said, Where have ye laid Him? They said unto Him, Lord, come and see. And as Jesus made His way there to that cemetery where Lazarus was, you know what it's like you go to a cemetery and a funeral. Most every single person that there is weeping over the loss of a loved one. And verse number 35 simply says, Jesus wept. You've probably been brought to tears before as some of your brothers and sisters and family members may experience horrific circumstances, even believers in Christ as we see each other go through things and endure things and we pray with one another. And man, uh, I remember years ago, being up in a up in a, a top of a loft at a, at a church praying while the services are going on and weeping for people to be saved that I don't even know that are out there in the auditorium. How could you do such a thing? Jesus Christ Himself wept as He saw what was going on in the hearts and minds of His people that He loved so very much. And He knew that the exercise that they were receiving was going to benefit them greatly but yet he was still moved to tears as they watched them go through these things. We think Jesus doesn't care. And I know we say, you know, from a Christian perspective, we know he cares for us and he loves for us, but you know what? Do our lives really demonstrate that or show him that we believe that? Remember, we've got to make our requests known unto him. We've got to listen to him. And we've got to believe and trust what he says. Amen? And wait on him. He's going to come through. Jesus was moved to tears. Then said the Jews, verse 36, Behold how He loved Him. They recognize the physical reaction that Jesus Christ is having as He's watching all these people. And they draw the wrong conclusion here. Now He does love them, doesn't He? But listen what they say in verse number 37. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? They're looking at these circumstances and they're like, man, he's too late. He didn't come when he was supposed to. Man, we watched and heard of him healing blind people and diseases and sickness. Why couldn't he just raise, why, why couldn't he just stop this guy from dying? Begin to question. And listen to Jesus here, verse number 38. Jesus, therefore again, groaning in Himself, cometh to the grave. He's still tore up inside by watching His people and the grief that they're going through. 
Verse 38, it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha. Or I'm sorry, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. We consider as God gives us a little, tiny, menial part in participating in the great victory that He wants in our lives, so often we'll come up with excuses as to why we want to do something very, very simple. When He's just said, okay, go ahead and do this. And, wow, you were Moses. Wow, I don't talk so good. And I'm, uh, I'm not this and I'm not that. Are you sure it's me you want to do that? And you know what? God wants us to participate. He wants us to participate in this. Just as we raise our children and we try and teach them and guide and direct them, we have them do some things as they're learning, right? We have them experience some things as they grow older and they become adults. Sometimes we have to sit by and just go, man, I could solve this for them right now, but I've got to let them have a little bit of pain in this. They've got to be able to experience some of these things. They've got to be able to live through this. They've got to be able to see God's hand working in their life. And you know what? Jesus is no different. He tells them to take away the stone. You know, as we consider taking away the stone in our, our lives, as we cry out to God to rescue us, as we listen to what He has to say, as we believe and trust Him, and he, as He asks us to do something very small, we need not make excuses, but we need to just follow His direction. We need to follow what He says. Knowing that he has our best interest in mind. It doesn't matter whether it's the worst health thing you could have ever experienced, losing your job, uh, whatever. It doesn't even matter. God's still God, isn't He? So why should we be getting all wound up over it and not worrying about it and making excuses when He says, I want you to do this small little part right here. Verse 40, Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest seest the glory of God? He's reminding her here of what he said way back in verse number 4 where he said he's not going to die. This is for the glory of God. This is so that you guys might believe even more. And Jesus told her that. He said it in verse number 25 again but, uh, that, that she needs to believe. Amen? Come on, you ready to believe? And he says, didn't I already tell you this? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Now, of course, God the Father is going to hear his son, Jesus Christ, part of the Trinity. Amen? They're all one. They all agree in one. And you might think, why would he say such a thing? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad he, he made it Barney style in the next verse for us here. Say, why would Jesus say that? Father, thank you for hearing me. Why would he say that? Verse number 42. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it. He's saying this openly so the other people that are there can hear what he's talking about and hear the conversation that he's having with God the Father, and he's doing it for their benefit because they're standing there. And why? Furthermore, verse 42 goes on to say that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Remember, Jesus said, I'm going to be glorified in this. And even though it was very painful, the people are in great turmoil. Their hearts are torn apart in sorrow. And Jesus openly, as He's talking with God the Father, says, I'm saying these things because they're here so that they might believe. Imagine you're standing there listening to that. I'd be thinking to myself, man, what am I going to, what am I going to see? What's going to happen? Like God's going to be glorified. How could I still think even at this time right here that it'd be difficult for these people to get their minds around the fact that he's going to get ready to raise a dead man from the dead and bring him back out of the grave. Verse 43, And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice and says, Lazarus, come forth! People were just hanging on their edge of their seats, I'm sure, in their mind. Wondering, what is he going to do? Like, how can he do something? He's, he's saying he's going to be glorified. He's telling us we need to believe. And I wonder what he's going to do. And then he cries out for Lazarus to come out of the grave. I can imagine at that moment, everyone kind of like looking at each other like, what? Looking at each other. Are you kidding me? He's just called for Lazarus. Lazarus has been in there for four or five days already. 
And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. We consider Jesus Himself giving these directions here to loose Him and let Him go. How simple is that? Man, this guy came walking out of a grave and he's got grave clothes on and stuff on his face and Jesus says, hey, go, go get that stuff off Him and, and free that man up from that stuff. You think about it in the scope of everything that's taken place. Lazarus dying being placed in a grave, resurrected, not in the normal resurrection, but brought back from the dead out of the ordinary. And he comes walking out and Jesus simply tells him, hey, roll that stone out of the way and remove the, the grave clothes and, and let him be free from that. That was man's part in this whole circumstance right here. Not a very big deal. They didn't do a whole lot, did they? God did everything. He just wanted us to participate. He just wanted them to participate in this. You know, so often when we get close to things like this, when we actually participate and do a small part in something, um, we learn a little more from it. It resonates a little deeper with us. This, this right here in itself is an amazing, amazing object lesson. As He uses the life of a human being and the loss of that life, to show and demonstrate His great love for the people that were there on the face of the earth at that time, that I do love you, and I'm going to show you how much I love you. And He says, once again in verse number 24, I am the resurrection, Martha. This is before Jesus Christ was crucified. This is before He Himself had been resurrected. And He's telling Martha, I am the resurrection. This is the God that we serve. Amen? <coughs> Jesus Christ is all and in all. As we consider these things today. What is our part? God does His part. We need to make our requests known unto Him. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. We need to tell Him. We need to take the stone away. We need to remove our own barriers that we've allowed to get in the way of our relationship with God. Our own sinful behavior. That's where we get to the place and we, we ask God to search me, O God, and know my heart. Try my reins. We need to ask God to make it open and obvious to us if we've done some things that have uh, come against Him. And, and once we realize that, once we understand that, and we begin to remove those barriers, we need to come to Him. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's where we need to come. We make our requests known. We need to remove those barriers in our life. We need to self-examine ourselves. We need to ask God to try us. And then we need to ask Him to forgive us. And you know what? If we don't come to the same conclusion to Him, that's going to be a problem. Verse number 10 of uh, John chapter number 1 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. And if we can't agree with God on our very own sin, you know what gets to happen for us? We get to do another lap. We get to do another lap. We get to run on that little hamster wheel a little bit longer. Until we can agree with God to remove some barriers from our lives and say, yep, God, I agree what I'm doing. That's sinful. And I'm asking you to forgive me. If we can't get to that place and agree with Him on that, we may be running another lap. Amen? Genesis chapter number 6, verses 14 through 16. The Bible says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth 50, and the height 30 cubits. And, and God could have rescued mankind back then at the flood, amen, when He's given Noah these instructions to do. But Noah had a part to do. He had to do something with this. And God said, here, I'm going to give you the plan. I'm going to tell you how to do it, but you're going to need to do some things. And when you do them, I'm going to rescue you. 
I'm going to rescue your family. And I'm going to handle things for you. Judges chapter number 7, verses 1 through 3. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moriah uh, in the valley. This is the time where Gideon had called God. God had called Gideon to do something great and to rescue his people. And he was going to provide and he was going to do the things that God can only do. But listen what happens in verse number 2. The Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. God says, You have too many resources right now. Gideon, we need to strip some of this away because the work that I'm going to do it's going to be open and obvious that I'm the one that has done it. And it has nothing to do with you, Gideon. You're going to be my instrument. And you're going to go forward, but it's me that is doing it. Judges chapter 7, verse 3, he goes on to say, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. And you remember, God whittled that army down to hardly anything. So that everybody that was watching those circumstances go on could see Gideon was doing what God had him to do, but man, Gideon was in a very, very, very vulnerable position. But he still had to do. 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse number 17. David doing what he could do. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it. And he went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Raphim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto the David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thy hand. And David came to Belperzim, um, and David smote them there and said, Lord... Uh, uh, the Lord hath broken up, broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of the place Belperzim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Raphim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass and go behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. You know, David, I'm so encouraged by the fact that David was seeking God in this and at every moment, at one moment, God says, yep, go ahead and go forward. We're going to handle this. And the next moment, God says no to the very same question, to go against the very same people. God says, no, no, I'm going to do it differently now. In fact, you're going to go on that other side over there. You're going to, you're going to get on the back side over there and you're going to go over there by those mulberry trees. And listen what he says in verse 24 of 2 Samuel 5. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. He says, David, go around the backside. Go around where all that grove of mulberry trees is. Have you ever guys heard the wind blowing through large trees? It's something else. It's a sound that's like, whew. God says, when you hear that, you'll know that I've gone on before you. And at times when we're doing what God has called us to do and we're trying to do our part, God may say, hold on a minute. Wait for me. I'm the one who's going in front of you. Verse number 25 of 2 Samuel 5 and David did so as the Lord commanded him and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gazar. God did his part. David did his part. And God blessed as a result. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Philippians 4, verse 7 reminds me, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 
Amen. As we take away that stone, we really got to listen to God. John 10, 27, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and they follow Me. Verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of My hand. Not even yourself. Can't happen. Amen? Amen. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1-5, through five, My son, if thou wilt receive My words and hide My commandments with Me, so that thou wilt incline thine ear unto wisdom and imply thy heart unto understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God our part amen we gotta listen to him and when we listen then we need to listen some more amen then we got to listen some more mark 4 24 says and he said unto them take heed what ye hear with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you and unto you that hear shall more be given psalm 25 4 says show me thy ways o lord Teach me thy paths. Verse number 5 goes on to say, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. That's our part. We've got to listen. We've got to listen. We've got to listen some more. We may need to wait. We may need to take a couple steps. We may need to wait. We need to listen. Romans 10.17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Remember what Jesus says? I'm doing these things so that you might believe. So that you might have your faith increased. Psalm 119.105 says, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2 says, and it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all His commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. And if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Amen? And so we listen and we listen and we listen more. But then we got to take some appropriate action. Just like David did. Just like Moses did. Just like so many other men of God and this Word of God demonstrated them following the commandments and the direction of Jesus. James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. John 14.15 says, If ye love Me, keep My commandments. That's our part. That's the appropriate action that we got to take. We got to do. John 15:10 says, "If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love." Jesus is not telling us to do something that he didn't do and align with. Amen. He's God. He showed us how to do it. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, "I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Getting immersed and listening, saying, Lord, I'm going to do what you'd have me to do. And never forget this, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1-5, through 5, And you hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Whereby in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. What an amazing thing. 
to consider what our part is. Make our requests known. Remove those barriers. Listen to God. Listen to God. Listen to God. Take those appropriate steps. God is so very good in how He challenges us and how He grows us in His Word. Might we be willing to do our part in that process? Let's pray. Father, You are so very good to us. We thank You for the truth of Your Word. We pray that You'd help us as we go out even now, Lord, that we would be willing to do our part, the lot that You have given us to do in our individual lives. Help us to be patient and wait on You. Help us to listen to You. Help us to share our whole hearts with You. And help us to be moved to action so that we can demonstrate our great love that we have for You. Bless as we go out throughout this week, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen.